now and welcome back to Politics and Land in Hawaii with Dennis Isaki on Think Tech Hawaii. Today we're fortunate to have with us Miley Shimabukuro, State Senator, representing Waianae District 22. She attended Iolani School and the William S. Richardson School of Law in Hawaii. She has served in the State House of Representatives and was appointed to the State Senate by Governor Abercrombie to replace Colleen Hanabusa, where she has been since 2010. As I recall, Abercrombie, Governor Abercrombie also appointed Malama Solomon at the same time. Mali, welcome to politics in Hawaii and on uh, Think Tech Hawaii. Please tell us a little about yourself, your key accomplishments, and why you want to continue to serve in the state set. Miley? Thank you, Dennis. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, well, I can tell you that uh, I, I'm an attorney by trade. Uh, I've been at a legal services organization for longer than I can want to share, uh, several decades now. And um, that really opened my eyes to the importance of having people in politics that really see how it impacts the most vulnerable in our society. Because, you know, for people like me and you, I mean, what happens at the square building doesn't, doesn't have a huge impact necessarily on our day-to-day -day lives, but for people whose existence relies on the safety net of our state, what we do can have a major impact. Um, and so I saw that firsthand um, before I got into politics when the state said they were gonna limit welfare benefits to people, um, disabled people to six months, saying, oh, that's enough time for them to transition from state assistance to federal assistance. And um, our legal services organization had to file a class action lawsuit because that meant, I think at the time there were, I wanna say something like 4,000, 5,000 know, 5, people who would basically, you know, become homeless and, and destitute if their benefits were to be cut off in six months. Because we knew that when you try to get onto um, federal social security, it takes about two to three years to get on. So anyway, it was, um, it was you know, thank goodness at, at the very last, at the 11th hour, we were able to get an uh, injunction against the state. Um, but it really opened my eyes to the importance of um, having the right testimonies and the right, um, the right facts and information before the, the policymakers, before these kinds of laws are passed. Um, so it's been extremely re rewarding for me to be in, to have both positions, to be a legal services attorney and to be a politician at the same time, because I've gotten to see firsthand how bills that I pass, which may seem small in, in someone else's eyes, make a huge impact in someone else's life, um, in my clients' lives. Um, you know, and just, just for an example, I mean, one of the bills that I got passed when I first got in was that if you were trying to claim for um, welfare disability, in the past, you could only claim a physical or a mental disability. You couldn't claim both. And we would see so many times that people would be denied uh, welfare because they couldn't show evidence of their, their whole body, you know. Uh, and so now we're able to bring that kind of evidence in to these kinds of hearings because now the law, has, I was able to get the law changed to so say you can, you can present those arguments. So I've seen, you know, several people that, uh, that would have been denied without that bill that were able to get approved. And, that, and that kind of thing has been just extremely satisfying for me. So I feel very, very fortunate to have the position that I do. Yeah, thanks. Um, I know you have, uh, the what we call it the YNI district, right? Um, it, does it include the, the, the power plant, the landfill? Yes. The there? Mm. Uh, yes. Yeah, the, and, the misnamed and, Waimanala Gulch. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> to this day, I mean, it's, it's just a mystery why it's, it's in Nanakuli, but yeah. yet it's named Waimanala Gulch. But yes. Yeah, so my district actually starts um, actually at the edge of Kalailoa. So right where there's the down to earth, you know, there's that Kapolei Commons Mall. That's where my district starts. And then it hit, from there, it heads west towards uh, Kaena Point. What about the, uh, the coal-fired plant? Um, PAR? Yeah. Is it PAR? I yeah, think PAR yeah. might be in Gabbard's district, Senator yeah. Gabbard's, yeah, possibly. Yeah. But that, 
Yeah, definitely. Just, I do just, have. Just I do that. have part of. It might be, you know, yeah. because I yeah. I have part of Campbell Industrial Park. Uh, so yeah, possibly par might be. I, I know. I know definitely uh, the Kahe Power Plant. Oh and, yeah, uh, Kahe yeah. definitely is. Yeah. And, and then uh, you saw some of the some mag magazine and online thing about uh, your district being one of the. Uh, how should I put it? Not not the best place to live in Hawaii. Oh yeah, I mean, that's been something that uh, has always plagued our, our coastline is that, well, we're very isolated, you know, there's only one way in and one way out. And so that, that makes the traffic, you know, very, very, you know, that's, that's a, a constant source of stress for everyone that lives on this coast and a constant source of concern too, because if there's some kind of emergency, um, we, we all might end up trapped here and unable to get in and out and that kind of thing. And that's happened many, many times. <laughs> um, but on top of that, um, you know, we also bear the burden of so many environmental injustices on the Waianae Coast. So we've got, yeah, we've got the, both the municipal solid waste landfill and then the construction demolition landfill. We have um, uh, Makua Military Reservation. We have the Lulu'ale Military Reservation. Um, we have the Kaena Point Tracking Station. Um, we have a uh, sewer. We have a lot of the telecommunication lines uh, run through this district as well. Um, H Power is right in our backyard. Um, I mean, yeah, there's a whole slew of environmental things that happen out here. And, and um, you know, and, and also uh, it, there's, it's very, it's poverty stricken. You know, we have the highest concentration of Hawaiians in the, in the world outside of Niihau. And it's, um, the Hawaiians are people who are illegally overthrown and dispossessed of their land, their culture, their way of life. And unlike, you know, you and I probably, right, whose parents were immigrants and chose to come to the United States for, to make a better way of life. For them, it was imposed, this Western culture was imposed upon them. And so it's still, you know, I, you, you, know you can still see it here. The suffering of the indigenous culture um, is, is very apparent on the Waianae Coast. And, and you know, um, at the same time, of course, it's, it's a place of amazing beauty. And I feel so um, fortunate to be, to have grown up around the Hawaiian culture where it's perpetuated and, and preserved because there are so many beautiful things about it. And in so many ways, uh, the Hawaiian people are really finding their way um, now too. And um, so there's so much to be celebrated about their culture as well. And there's so many positive things that are happening in this coast in addition yeah. to the negative and the bad things. Yeah, thanks. Um... Yeah, along that lines, uh, recently, I guess, uh, it's the legislature has appropriated, was it 600 million to DHHL, uh, which I'm sure, you know, you're spearheaded. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about it? Yes, I mean, it's, it's, it's so exciting um, that the bill that passed, this is Senator Keoho Kololei's bill, H, um, it was his, well, his companion, HB 2511. Um, and this measure uh, is really, uh, you know, it's monumental and historic to have $600 million. It's the biggest one-time cash infusion that DHHL has ever gotten. Um, and what's really exciting about it as well is that for the first time, it allows DHHL to provide cash awards to people on the wait list. And so, you know, what Star Advertiser and others have pointed out is that you know, there's 30,000 on the wait list. The biggest demand for um, homesteads is on Oahu. And yet the smallest amount of land holdings left to build homesteads is Oahu. So if you just, you obviously just, just look at that, that, there's no way that the state can satisfy the needs of the people on the wait list if we keep going the way we're doing it now. So someone brilliant thought of this idea and said, hey, rather than limit the wait listers to, to the land holdings that we have, why don't we give them cash and just say, you know, hey, if you want to go and purchase a property fee simple outside the trust lands, you have that right, that option. So if I'm a homesteader and I want to wait list and I want to buy a, a, a house in Kailua or Hawaii Kai or, you know, Waipahu, whatever, I, I have that ability. I don't have to just limit myself to, to where DHHL has its homesteads. And so this is very, very exciting. Um, and it also will 
provide, you know, what the hope is that it'll give them, give homesteaders much more flexibility than they do now. Because you know, right now, when you, if you live on a homestead, um, there's been, there's pros and there's cons, you know, because it's a, it's a, it's a 99 year lease, but you don't hold title to the land in a way. It's, it's a, it's a leasehold too, 99 year. So there's, there's limitations of what you can do. If you want to get an equity line of credit, if you want to, if you want to sell it, if you want to do all these different things, there's much more, um, strings you have a lot more you know your hands are tied in ways that pretty simple owners are not and so the hope is that uh, with this new program we can really help um, beneficiaries to build wealth in the way that people in the private sector can and to have much more flexibility uh, in in handling their real estate uh, in much the way that people out in outside the homesteads can so Anyway, stay tuned for you know how that's going to come about. That the talk was that it would be maybe a hundred thousand um, that we would offer as a cash award to someone on the wait list um, as an alternative to waiting to get a, a lot awarded to you. Okay, well, well, it still stands at uh, fifty percent, but quantum. I guess it's uh, it has to be decided on by Congress, right? if there's any changes. Yes, yes, you know, and um, well, it would be, a, it, would, it would need to be initiated by the state. I, well, I guess I guess Congress could come in and if they wanted to change it, I guess they could. Um, but the state, I would I think the, that usually the way that we change um, laws within DHHL are via state, a state bill passing first and then getting approved by Congress. Right, right. right. And um, that question has come up before us several times and it's just, I think it's just too soon to make that drastic of a change. When you have 30,000 that are still waiting that are 50% yeah. to then add to the mix. Now we're going to reduce the blood quantum. It's uh, unfortunately, it's, it's a, it's a sad thing to have to divide the Hawaiians in that way. Um, but at, at this point in time, I think it's too soon to try to bring such that kind of change into the picture. But what we did do, however, is that as far as successorship goes, um, the current law says it's, you can you can be one quarter um, right. and still get it become a successor, but we passed a bill to be one thirty second, um, and Congress has not approved that yet. But uh, Congressman Kahele did introduce a measure to um, to get Congress to approve it. So we're hoping that that'll pass, and so then that'll really allow someone who holds a current homestead to kind of to have, have a surety that it'll stay in their family. You know, if they can pass it down to someone with a little, as little as 132nd blood quantum uh, that can really provide them security. Okay, thanks. How about uh, moving to the uh, HTA's $34 million contract with uh, CNHA for marketing and uh, destination management? Any comments on that? Oh, I think that is, that's fantastic. Um, you know, uh, CNHA is, is just done doing amazing work. Uh, and I'm so glad that HTA and the state have recognized them as a leader uh, and, and really a groundbreaker in terms of um, how to find ways to really help not just Hawaiians, but our community. Um, and so I think it's a great thing. I mean, what, what CNHA did when the pandemic struck and Mary Monarch was eliminated and all the crafters and vendors that could no longer sell their Where's the Mary Monarch Festival. So then CNHA said, you know what? We're going to put you guys all online. And their pop-up makeke is like so incredibly popular uh, that it, they're overwhelmed with orders, you know, <laughs> which is great, you know? And so now these vendors not, you know, who thought that they're, they were devastated by the pandemic. Now they're better, they're better off than they were before many. They're getting orders from around the world. Um, and so, yeah, so I think it's great. I think, CNHA will really help HTA to go to the next level. Yeah, good. Uh, continuing on to OHA, the state still owes uh, OHA some more money. Um, yeah, you know, what I, I'm really happy to report that this this session, um, uh, Senator Keo Kaloli's bill, um, SB 2021, passed. And this is a bill that was a long time coming that OHA had been trying to get their public lands trust revenue increased. And we finally did, um, we're giving them $64 million in retroactive pay 
and finally increasing their pro rata share, per, their annual share from 15.1 million to 25.1 million per year. Um, and setting up a negotiating committee as well to look at issues going forward. Um, so it really was a triumphant year for, for OHA as well as DHHL. Uh, and um, I know that there's still more work to be done, but I'm so happy that we finally did something in the right direction. Yeah, you've been busy in your committee. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, it was, yeah. I, I was so fortunate to be uh, in this committee at, at this time of year. Yeah. So, you know, like, um, well, you know, we talk about CNHA and uh, tourism. Uh, I just heard uh, today the Lieutenant Governor talking about more taxes or impact fees for tourists. And he said they would decrease the low end tourists. But some of us are low end, you know, people who travel to other places and I, I wouldn't want them to say like, you know, you guys cannot come, you don't have enough money. <laughs> so so I, 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 seriously, I know, what do you think about that? No, I, I hear you, you know, and, um, and actually, I mean, it's interesting because the whole reason, my understanding is the whole reason that we had this huge surplus this year, unprecedented, I think it was a $2 billion surplus is because of the surge in tourism. Um, and which and, our, and we don't even have the full blast tourism going on, right? I mean, it's mostly uh, from U.S. and places like that because a lot of the international places still aren't fully reopened. Um, so whatever we're doing, we're doing it right. I mean, I I told that to HTA and they, I did the HLTA um, uh, candidate questionnaire and I said, you know, keep doing what you're doing because it's working. And so even if that does mean we're bringing in the, you know, the tourists that, that shop at Costco and that like to make their own food. And yeah. I mean, it's working because we have a surplus and I agree. I, yeah. I'm the same way, you know? And so I, I hope that we can find a balance, um, you know, because I, and I really liked the, the county at one point was thinking about allowing bed and breakfast that are hosted. And I think that's something that I think most of us could embrace. You know, I think I think as long as as long as it's a, a homeowner, it's our neighbor. We have you know neighbors that um, half the year they 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 live somewhere else. You know, uh, but I think and I think that's fine with us if they were to host a bed and breakfast because at least we know there's there's accountability, and um, and we know who they are. So I, I think I think we should strike a balance between attracting the high end tourists and, and then those tourists that are the more economical types like like me and you. Yeah, like uh, uh, people have commented on the hotel room rates right now, it's kind of gone up, you know, like people want to come from Oahu to Kauai, say like, we can't afford the hotels anymore. Even the Kamai and the rates are like three, 400 bucks. Uh, so it, it uh, and also the traffic we've been, you know, with the pandemic, Guys over here have been happy, like, oh, traffic's so nice. And then now it's starting to come back, <laughs> but not as much as uh, pre pandemic. But uh, get all the things that goes along with increased tourism, right? Uh, such as transportation. Um, are you on that committee also? I am. I am. Yeah. And um, yeah, you know, with, with transportation, I, I mean, I'm really. I know it was really a struggle because at the end, towards the end of the pandemic, I don't know if it's still a problem now, but I know it was really, really expensive to try to rent a car. And then that's when people started doing Turo and started renting yeah, their own right. cars out. And, and uh, hey, my hat's off to people like that that are entrepreneurial like that and can think of ways to make their own money. Um, but one of the things that we did is that we passed the rental car surcharge. And, uh, and that um, is something that... Um, once it really gets going and our tourist economy starts going again, it's going to be a great thing actually for locals because it's going to provide DOT with funding to, you know, to improve our highways and, and all the infrastructure things that people are always complaining about uh, to us. I mean, for, for every, all, of, all of us elected officials, that's a constant thing. We're always getting complaints from people about traffic and uh, bridges and, and roads and you know, you know, whatever potholes and, and, and you name it, that, that's a constant source of frustration. And so um, 
I think the rental car surcharge thing can be something that hopefully uh, won't impact Kama Aina too much and that tourists won't feel too much, won't be too much of a hit, but at the same time can really be a win-win by improving traffic for everyone, tourists and locals alike. Yeah, let, I understand that uh, the rental car companies shipped a whole bunch of them back uh, out of the state during the pandemic. And I don't think many of them came back yet, the car, so the Turo and those other uh, car rentals uh, are still, uh, still doing good. Um, what else we got here? Uh, I know why not area, got the coastal highway, the environment, the sea level rise um, is a concern. Any uh, thing you're doing on that? Oh yeah, um, that is a constant, area, uh, you know, issue of concern uh, for our coastline. And so, um, you know, a couple of the things that we're working on are a parallel route for the Wainai Coast. I mean, that's both for emergency purposes and just for the daily grind and the daily um, issue of traffic. And so we have, uh, there's $4 million that um, all of us area legislators, you know, Rep Gates, Rep Eli and myself and our colleagues uh, obtained for the Wanna Coast, and um, the governor did uh, release those funds to DOT, four million, to work on that. And we're looking at opening. Um, there's a back road up up in the valley, um, a Paakea Road, and locals know that that's a well-known area that you you go to when Farrington Highway is shut down. But there's a one point one and a half mile stretcher show that's gated off except in times of emergency. And so the funds are intended to open those gates. And so that for a day on a daily basis, you, we can use those back roads. Um, it's, it's a big undertaking though, because it's gonna involve having, you know, the government will have to take over both Paakea and Lululee Naval Road. Um, Paakea is privately owned and the Naval Road is owned by the Navy. And so, and they're both gonna have to be brought up to county standards. So it's a big undertaking. We're working on that. And also Makaha Surfing Beach area. Um, uh, the state's going for a grant to reroute that highway as well further inland. Yeah, you're talking about, you know, the alternate highway on Kauai, there's the uh, Oilua Bridge. If, if that is closed, then uh, connecting the Kapa side to the Lihue, you get to go way up Mauka in a old mm. volcano road. So it, it's a similar thing you can look at. And uh, you know, there's all the talk about sea level rise and in so many years, Waikiki is going to be inundated. And I'm sure part of Waianae is low, low area too. So what's uh, being done or if anything on the sea level rise concern? Yeah, well, I'm happy to say that um, I got a bill passed SB 2865 for $40 million in special purpose revenue bonds to dip Hawaii. And they are working on carbon capture um, and trying to take our carbon waste and make into liquefied food grade carbon dioxide. And that's gonna be used for agriculture and renewable energy. And just to take us a step more you know, forward towards renewable energy and getting off of coal and addressing climate change in that way. Um, and it's very, very exciting. I know that our time is running out, so let you know, just signal me if I need to stop. Um, but uh, it's very exciting because Dibs Hawaii is um, owned by Keone Ford, who's a, a Hawaiian um, from Waianae, young man, and he has a whole consortium of people working with. And uh, they're very, very excited about the potential of this project, not just on the Waianae coast, but um, statewide, to really, to finally have our own carbon dioxide, which I guess is a very valuable commodity uh, and can go a long way towards um, really using clean energy, you know? so. It, he said it can help with hemp production. Um, he, he's been using it now to do, um, to clean, he where has a DOD contract where they use the carbon dioxide to, to clean, um, I guess it's machinery and um, planes and that the like without any kind of waste products or any kind of toxins going into the, into the back into the waste stream. Um, and so he really knows the potential of uh, carbon dioxide and what it, of what it can do to help our economy and what a valuable commodity it is. And he would 
he's looking at places like par you know because you mentioned you know par is going to schedule to close i think right in the next year i assume right uh, yeah the and, coal fired uh, plant is yeah. yeah they're supposed to stop doing coal or something yeah. and so yeah. he would take the carbon dioxide waste from a place yeah. like par yeah. and turn that into um this valuable liquefied um food grade carbon dioxide yeah talking about uh uh, renewable energy, uh, as you may know, Hawaii uh, Island Utility Cooperative leads the nation in uh, renewable energy. So we've been doing good, and uh, Iku is, you know, following along. They're, they're doing more and more uh, with new renewable energy. Um, yeah, getting on housing, uh, what's uh, your take on? What they're everybody talking about, you know, like affordable housing, you know, housing prices and all that. Yeah, well, I, I really I'm excited about what um, Stanley Chang is doing in our chair of housing committee is he really he's taking a delegation to Vienna this uh, over the interim in September because he's looking at countries like Vienna and Singapore where housing is a right, um, you know, like how public education is a right, you know, in the United States. Um, he wants to um, make it the same, bring it to the same level in Hawaii. And I think he's onto something because, uh, you know, that, that's why we see the brain drain. We see people, you know, they, they can't afford to stay here anymore. It's so tragic, you know, when people see their kids and their grandkids have to leave because they can't afford to buy their own house in Hawaii. Uh, and so I think I support the Aloha Homes concept that Senator Chang is trying to pursue, where really the state takes it on, you know, that, that we become the provider of public housing. And when we say public housing, it's, it's really high quality public housing. Uh, so it's like what, you know, like the condos you see in Kaka'ako, that's the kind of public housing we're talking about. And uh, in countries like Singapore, 80% um, of the people or more live in public housing um, because the government has made it so attractive and uh, so uh, viable for, for people. And, but it's no longer a profit-making thing. Housing has become yeah. like public education, it's a right. Yeah, well, I get uh, mixed uh, feelings about this, quote, Singapore model. Um, uh, even several years ago, you're talking about building like 300 square foot units in on Oahu, I think it was in Kaka'ako. And they're like, oh, we're gonna sell it for 400,000 or something. It's kind of steep on that. There was several years ago. Uh, it's because it's good for Singapore. You know, this is Hawaii. Uh, I think uh, many people have said the government red tape is, has a lot to do with the housing costs over here and the lack of housing, or you know, the time it takes to mm -hmm. do housing. I, I think we got to look at that. Long time ago, I keep, I keep repeating it like. Uh, when HFDC first came on and they, they built a couple A from scratch and on housing, they had, uh, they had what they call the Act 15, which is kind of extreme that uh, they could bypass some of the reg regulations. The agency could do that when they mm -hmm. built, you know, it was like a two-edged sword in the, in the, in the county and the state. Uh, sit in the county and say, okay, you bypassed that. We're not going to inspect it. So you you upkeep it all that. I think the uh, state is still paying for that because they didn't work together with the county on the, the roads and stuff. Um, they, they had another extreme thing on the land use commission. They told developers, you got to do 60% affordable, um, which the developers who kind of uh, kind of like chop eat too much into the profits, I guess. But um, what HFDC did, the original HFDC, they tied in market homes as well as the quote affordable and had this uh, fast track. Uh, and, you know, Granted, you can make money on the, uh, the market homes to help subsidize the lower ones. 
that's that's another thing too you know if you make it easier for the developers you know i know developers get bad name but to uh, you know cut out some of the red tape then they'll have more housing for people like you and me and less people trickle down to the full uh, or they call it affordable uh, it's a misnomer just because you call it affordable well, you know it doesn't make it but on the you know uh, lower cost homes then this the county and the state goes oh we're in that home so we got to do it we're going to exempt ourselves from everything and we're going to do it fast. which they do they do the homes but i think you know if if you make it easier for the other guys to build it, then you wouldn't have to do it yourselves. Any comments on that? Yeah, no, I, I hear you. Um, and because here on the Waianae Coast, we saw that firsthand because when there was the homeless crisis, Governor Lingle declared an emergency uh, and lifted a lot of the permitting requirements and um, exempted, you know, waived a lot of them. And so we saw like rapid development of much needed uh you know um in Mer there was an emergency shelter that was built similar to ihs uh and it was like through these amazing military um structures that were put up and to, to this day it's still it's still here which is great i mean it serves a, it's a 24-hour shelter it's it's exactly what we needed on the one Coast. and uh, and there were several other projects that were made uluke kukui was made with stanford car um emerged another transitional shelter and there were several others and um I think there were, there were several made uh, built in Kalai Loa as well. And so, yeah, that kind of great. Yeah. Sorry to cut you off. <laughs> Sorry, I just checked the time. We're running out of time. Uh, any uh, last words? Um, I guess I just want to just tell people that, you know, I welcome your feedback, your comments, concerns. Uh, you can you can reach me. My email is myleishimabukuro at yahoo.com. And my website is uh, electmile.com, electmile.com. But thank you so much to Think Tech Hawaii for providing this programming and inviting me to be on the show. I appreciate you, Dennis. Thank you and your team. Yeah, mahalo. Mahalo, uh, Senator Miley Shimabukuro, and uh, mahalo to our viewers on Think Tech Hawaii. Uh, if you like the Think Tech free media shows, Please help support the nonprofit platform with a donation. Aloha, mahalo, ahuiho, malama pono. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.